Hi, everybody, and welcome to this edition of Macro Pro and Friends. I'm Diane Cohen, and I'm joined today by Chris Champlin. And Chris, um, I see that you are not in an office setting. So you and I have been friends for a very long time. Um, so for me to see you outside of work is kind of normal, but our guests today don't, aren't. So can you tell us a little bit about what you're doing? Well, yeah, thanks, Diane. Uh, hey, everybody. I'm happy to see so many familiar names here. Uh, I am actually up in Grass Valley, uh, just outside Nevada County. Uh, I am the uh, past president of an organization called the Northern California Peace Officers Association. And I uh, forgot we were having a luncheon today with Sheriff Shannon Moon, and I'm in charge of the trailer. So I brought the, all of our equipment up here, and I'm sitting outside under the pines in beautiful Grass Valley, California, doing this webinar. And, and you're in Washington. I mean, technology is something. Here I am sitting outside in the pines, and you're up in, uh, what, Tacoma, SeaTac area? Yep, yep, exactly. I'm outside of, of Seattle for sure. Well, I am really glad that you could join us today. Your topic on getting answers to questions you never thought to ask, I think, is really an important one in the workers' compensation arena. I just want to say a few things before you get started today. So I'd like to tell everybody that they're going to be receiving their CEU certificates in about an hour after the presentation. So look for that email. And if you'd like to ask Chris some questions, I'll be monitoring the chat box or the question box. So please be sure to write your questions in and Chris will be happy to answer those for you. We do have and handouts for today's presentation. So that is on the control panel. Please be sure to download that so that you have it for future reference because Chris always has fantastic case studies and information. So you'll want to make sure that you have his handouts for uh, for the future. And then lastly, there will be an encore performance of this on the Macro Pro YouTube page. So for those of you who don't know who Macro Pro is, uh, Macro Pro is a document retrieval company. We gather records not only nationally, but also internationally. So we can get the records you need where, where you need them. Uh, we can produce them for you. Whether it's civil, workers' comp, it doesn't matter. We can handle it for you. All right. Well, Chris, you have uh, the floor. I'd like to thank everybody thank for joining us, and I'll see you at the end of the presentation. Yeah. Hey, thanks, Diane. Um, and again, folks, if you happen to see a uniformed police officer behind me, uh, don't be don't be alarmed. <laughs> I'm at a I'm at a luncheon with all of them. Um, so anyway, thank you again, Diane, for uh, allowing me the opportunity to to be here uh, and do this today. You know, one of the things that I've always prided myself on when I was kind of getting started in this industry is finding those underutilized things that investigators do. You know, backgrounds, for instance. I, I've always identified that, I've always thought backgrounds were underutilized. So what I wanna talk about today uh, is more of a medical records background type investigation where you will be able to answer, uh, say, I always screw this up. You will be able to ask the questions and you already know the answers. So that is kind of what the gist of today was. And I'm gonna give you some case studies. And again, I might get interrupted from time to time as I go through this. Uh, I am outdoors, so you'll hear some background noise. So again, if you have any questions, uh, raise your hand or ask Diane or, or whatnot. So let's get started. The first thing we need to realize when we're dealing with uh, in injury claims is medical doctors trust medical evidence. You've probably heard us say this before, but if you know, you're know you gonna show surveillance video, it better be damn compelling to get a doctor to change his mind. Um, the, what they really need is the medical evidence. If you, Instead of, if I had 10 hours of video of somebody sitting out on their front porch or uh, an MRI from a prior non-industrial injury, which one's gonna take more weight for the doctor? obviously the medical records, they're gonna trust that medical evidence. So what I say to you is let's go get it. Let's get the medical evidence we need to mitigate these claims, shut them down, maybe even get them to just cancel the whole thing because it was a pre-existing injury, or maybe it didn't even happen at work. So again, remember that medical doctors trust medical evidence. So why are medical record searches important and when should it be requested? Again, Going back to our platform of where I said background searches should be done right away, 
and so we call that our early detection background report, you want to identify prior injuries right away. And I know you're already doing that when you're asking the questions, when you do your initial AOE COEs. Wouldn't it be nice though to know the answers? You know, you've ran an index report, you've ran your uh, all of your uh, searches through your system to see what other claims they've had with that employer. Because I know it's it's normal for a, a long-term employee to have five or six claims, probably. <laughs> um, but again, remember, identify them right away, mitigate your exposure, and shut down that claim. Um, and the reason I put this up front is they make a big difference, like I said, in the eyes of the medical provider, and they're more cost effective than your traditional investigations. You know, going out and doing an AOE COE interview, uh, you have the drive time and the mileage, and you know, uh, that's gonna get costly. Surveillance is costly. This is a, an affordable way that is gonna make a bigger difference. So you're gonna spend less money and get more return on investment, more reward. So for instance, uh, let's talk about car accidents. You know, at the onset of a new claim, we always ask, have you ever been for hurt before? And the answer is normally, you know, I can't recall. So let's help them recall. Um, here we had, we did this case out of Florida and the uh, injured worker had a, a incapacitating injury. They had to be carried from the scene. So wouldn't that be something you would wanna help them recall, what I say? Help them remember, saying, well, have you ever been in a car accident? Have you ever been in an ambulance ride? And then they're gonna start going, oh, you know what? Yeah, all right. I do remember something a couple of years ago. Okay, great. Where did you treat? What was the emergency room you went to? <clears throat> Whatever, you know, what was the outcome of that injury? You see, you're going to help them remember this stuff by having this information available to you at the very onset of the claim. So now that you found the records, what do you do? Diane, this is where you come in. Remember, this is like our big thing. Now that you found the records, what's next? You go get them. You Absolutely. Get you, you go get them. Now that the, the injured workers told you, yeah, you know what? I, I, I treated at Queen of the Valley Hospital in Napa. Um, okay, great. You know what? I uh, know that Queen of the Valley, they have their own special release form. So why don't I send you some forms? You fill it out and then we can go get those records because, you know, your doctors are going to want that information to help you. You know, we're always helping. So now that you've found the records, go get them. Here's another one. This is a this was a really interesting case that we had out of Washington, Diane. This was up in your actually this was Portland, Oregon. Sorry, kind of the same. The Great Northwest. So the the adjuster talk about getting answers to questions you didn't think you had to ask. This claim came in. Claimant's name is Elizabeth. Elizabeth Marie <coughs> checked herself off as a female. Um, we were asked to do a background on this, but we, we ran that social, the one that was provided, nothing matched. Then we ran the date of birth, nothing matched. The address was associated to an Elizabeth, but now matched to our Elizabeth. So it turned out that the information on the, the first report of injury, this was uh, Oregon, so it's a they first report of injury form, not a 5020, wasn't consistent, nothing matched. <laughs> Here's what we found out. Elizabeth, her original name is actually Travis. The claimant was in the process of a gender transition treatment from male to female. The provided SSN was right, but you see it came back to a guy named Travis. So the adjuster had to call Elizabeth and ask her, Tra uh, Elizabeth, have you ever gone by the name of Travis before? And she said, yeah, that, that's me. Why is this important? Now, if I was in an audience, I know you all have answers. And I would say it's important because, Diane, maybe you can help me out with this. You see, Travis or Elizabeth, they haven't done the legal name change yet. We went, we searched the courts and they hadn't submitted in the state of Oregon, you can submit a form <coughs> if you're going, undergoing gender transition to change your name legally. She hadn't done that yet. So, Diane, if I was to say, hey, uh, this is what I got, who, what would have to be on the paperwork to go out and get those records? We'd want it also known as. So, um, you, she would fill out 
he, she uh, would fill out the form uh, based on what their legal name currently is. But if they have any medical records under a different name, we want to make sure that that information was also on the authorization form so that we can gather all records um, that would be in their name. And obviously, that's the only way we're going to be able to ter determine the true value of the claim for that person. So who would have thought you would have to have asked that question? And do you see how important that is to identify that right away? Not only just for medical records, but any kind of uh, documentation. Um, you know, you want to make sure that you address the claimant the way they would like to be addressed. Obviously, uh, she wanted to be addressed as Elizabeth, but all the records are under the name of Travis. So this opens the door to so many other things um, that needed to be covered at the onset of a claim. So again, that's why it's important. Um, you know, uh, I know I know it's uncomfortable sometimes to ask these questions of injured workers, but yet we have to do that. So <clears throat> like I said, here's another example. Your first question should always be about prior injuries. And the answer is because you already have the answer. Uh, this is another case study where we found, we did a medical record search and we've identified a, a, a treatment at a United Health Center that predated the data loss by a month. And we also found out that the claimant has an appointment coming that hadn't been confirmed yet. So right out of the gate, right within the first 60 days, <clears throat> we were able to identify the claimant's been treating at a United Health Center already, and they have an appointment coming up uh, for something that we don't know about yet. So obviously, now that we know this information, you go get the records. Um, and here's how you do this. And forgive me, I, I got some background noise here. I hope you can't hear it too bad. Diane, you, you're not picking up any of that background noise, are you? No, we, we don't hear anything, but you might want to adjust your camera so that we can see more of your face and less of the... Uh... Oh, sorry, I didn't realize you could see me still. Hi. <laughs> um, so. Some of these questions, they're kind of a leading question. And this is a topic that I get into a little bit when I do an interview uh, seminar conference. And one of the questions, so if we go back to that prior slide, you've already got the answers in front of you. So how are we gonna ask these? You're gonna say, have you ever received treatment in October just before you filed this claim? You wanna use a, a date, it's called memory recall. And the answer should be yes, because they kind of identified, hopefully the claimant understands that if you're asking about something specific, hey, have you ever gotten treatment just before this, when you filed this claim, say October? So they should say yes. <clears throat> then you want to ask the follow-up. Have you ever received treatment at United Health Centers? And again, they should say yes. And if you want to ask, well, do you have a follow-up appointment? Well, again, you would keep you, they, they should know. And, um, then obviously, did you ever receive treatment for? Or what did you receive treatment for? Now, that's the big question there, if it's the same injury. Now, if they say no to all of this, now you got a fraud case. Now it's suspicious because you already know that they've got treatment there. You already know that they've been there. Uh, you can find out what the date of their next visit is, maybe do some surveillance, get them coming and going from a medical doctor's office that has nothing to do with your claim. And that's where all the money in the bank. Forgive me, excuse me. <coughs> now that I know that you can see me. <laughs> so again, now that you found these records, what's next? Go get them. Don't wait. Um, you know, if you uh, can get them to sign a HIPAA release form, uh, wonderful. Uh, Diane and I do this training a lot, and we always talk about a general release form, which are better because HIPAA just covers the HIPAA and you might want this. For instance, on my way down, I got to get a police report. So if I have a, a general release form, that's easier for me to pick up. This, this topic came up a while ago <coughs> um, with a case I was doing. Are social media profiles private or public? The answer is it depends. Now, this does come up uh, a, a few times. It came up with uh, one of our clients. Um, let me explain it to you this way. If you're out at a public place, like right now I'm in at a park, I'm at Condon Park in Grass Valley. They're on social media. If I check in there, that's public. Um, 
a Yelp or a Google review, those are public. Um, now, if I have a private profile, like for instance, my social media profile is private, but I have the option of making it public or private on some of my posts. If I check in, like I am today at this park, I'm public. <coughs> so there is no expectation of privacy. I always tell everybody that once it's out there, it's out there to be had. Um, unless I'm catfishing you or creating a fake profile or trying to coerce you into becoming my friend on social media, or uh, you know, you have to uh, you know ask to be a friend, and then that information is used, that's kind of hokey. That that's something you want to worry about. But if it's public, game on. Dan, was there any questions? I see my my chat box. Something keeps popping up here. <coughs> no okay. All right. No questions at this time. Okay. For instance, this is kind of what I was talking about. <clears throat> this injured worker, should I grab a burger or visit my cardiologist? Well, probably want to do the cardiologist first. You like checking in at uh, in and out Burgers, as you can see. Uh, there are about three of them right there on just that page alone. He also likes JB Burgers. Um, they're talking about me in there, so excuse me. I'm saying hi to everybody. Hi, everybody. Um, he kept checking in at Desert Springs Hospital Medical Center in Las Vegas. We have one, two. Uh, he also checked into Desert Orthopedic Center two times, three times, and then he checked into a Dignity Health there. So now we've identified where he's treating for something. We don't know why. We don't know if it's him or if he's checking in for a family member, but we do know he's checking in at these locations. Uh, we also know that those were public. So this injured worker's profile, he checked in on public Facebook social media sites to say, hey, I'm here. Huh? That's free game, folks. We didn't have to do anything other than just find his Facebook page. And all we did was find all the places he checked in. So Diane, now that we know where he is possibly treating for something, what should we do? We should go and get records from all of those locations that he has tagged himself in. Now, whether or not he was the person that was being treated at the time, we don't know. So there could be certificate on no records. However, if we're doing our interviews, like you were saying, and we're going to be specific about the questions we ask, we should be able to get some of those answers. And if they answer it so that we believe them, maybe we don't go to that site. If it's a little janky, we might want to go get those records. It's obviously up to your discretion. But um, yeah, I think following your advice and asking direct questions is certainly going to help you determine where to get those records. Yeah, oh, well, you know, and thank you. And what we actually did on that specific case is we called those locations and we had the information for the injured worker and we called them and go, hey, I understand, you know, Joe checked in here on the 24th, um, just trying to verify if it was him and what the dates of service are and if there are any others. And we now we have not only did we get information that that injured worker provided uh, unbeknownst, unbeknowingly, uh, but now we verified that because that's the second part of this is you want to verify this information. Um, this is kind of off the off the beaten path, but I'm doing a case for Broadspire right now where the injured worker's name is Maria Gonzalez Ochoa. And we're trying to find records for Maria Gonzalez Ochoa. We identified 6,000 records in Los Angeles County for that one name. I don't know if it's her or not. And now we have to send somebody out to actually go out and verify that information, verify the date, verify the social, verify the spelling, uh, and verify the uh, a few other pieces of the alias and address. Then um, that's the second part of this equation is, you know, okay, you found it. Let's verify it's them too. So that's part two of this. Um, so this is kind of a pre-investigation checklist that I put together. These are some of the things that before you're ready to do a medical record search, you wanna have this information available. First of all, like we said, a release form. 
HIPAA release form, a general release form. When we make phone calls, uh, any investigation of whoever's doing your medical searches makes the initial phone call, they're, sometimes they'll say, hey, we're not gonna provide that information without a release form. If we happen to have that release form with us, we could fax it to them and get the records we want. Um, what also is a big help is the name of any current medical facilities. Let's not waste your time or ours by calling facilities you already know about. Look, we already know they're treating at Kaiser. We already know they're treating at Concentra. So tell us that. Tell us who the treating physician is. <clears throat> that way we're not going to call them. We're trying to find stuff that you didn't know about. Um, an index report. An index report is also a big help because we can also call those facilities. One of the things that I like doing is, you know, ferreting out all the information in the index report to make sure that 24 pages, at least, you know, 10 of them are of your injured worker. So that that's a big help if you want to send that over. Also, the data loss and the time of injury is important, too, because that's what we're looking for. We're looking for medical records that predate that specific date. Sorry, there's a lot of activity behind me. Um, another thing, too, we do an EDEX search, and I know uh, MacroPro does it, too. When we do the EDEX search and we find all the lean claimants, all the lean people, We'll add that to the list because we want to call them and make sure they still have the records. Because, Diane, how long are facilities, how long do they keep uh, medical records? Is there like a time limit on that? Seven, eight years or something? Typically, it's seven years. Um, <clears throat> but when they keep no. things online, for example, the new rules are more like two or three years that they're going to keep it online. But paper copies and that type of thing, it's usually seven years. Right. So let's call those facilities before you send Diane out. Let's make sure they still have some kind of records. You know, they might not have everything, but at least they would have enough for you to start asking your questions and start looking into stuff a little bit more. Um, so remember, this is kind of going back to the checklist. Not all facilities are willing to share information without a release form. So it's easier for us to have it and fax it to them. If you get it later, we could always call back now that we've identified that you know there are possibly records there and we can get it um like i said let's not waste time calling you know i know i'm being redundant here but this is important this really is so when you assign these cases out make sure you tell them where they're treating so that you know we're not calling around the other thing too that concerns me when we've done these in the past especially in small towns is when you start calling around maybe there's a family member that works there and says hey god you know so and so's we got a phone call that Gallagher Bassett is looking for some medical files on you. You know, we don't want to let them know we're doing this yet. And obviously your date of injury uh, helps. Um, going back, you know, this is an example of when we were working up a case. Um, these are prior claims uh, places. This came off an EDEX report and we were able to call all of these locations to identify a pre-existing Excuse me one second. My president just wants to talk to me. Hold on. Sorry, everybody. Yeah. We're ready. Oh, but you're busy. Yeah, I'm sorry. Okay. I'll be done here pretty soon, I think. Okay. Sorry about that. Um, we were able to find all this before they were able to uh, to before they were able to um, start asking questions. So this is this is a great example of information that was available uh, to start making the phone calls on. We have a cervical strain. Uh, harassment, a stress claim, um, personal auto. Um, this is some great stuff that was provided to us that we were able to put it into chronological order and then start making some phone calls on. So again, now that you've found those records, what do you do with them? You go get them. This is claimant, I've never been injured. Do you ever trust the claimants when they tell you that? I have never been hurt before. The answer should be no. Um, on June 25th, this guy alleged a slip and fall injury while working in Reno, Nevada. All right, that's great. Then, during the initial call with the claimant, he tells the adjuster he's never been injured before. Uh, the gentleman was a little bit older, so it's a little hard to believe that. He's 67 years old and claims he's never been hurt before. So, his background media investigations requested, and what do you think we found? Not only has he never treated before, but he's only visited one place seven times, another place one, two, three times. There's another place two times. And the irony was 
he was always treating down in LA. So why is he living up in Reno, working in Nevada, but he's treating down in the uh, Lancaster area? Well, that's where he was living. So he's been treating all these places that we identified off of social media. <clears throat> he was posting that he has been to all these places. He didn't think we were gonna find him. So of course we had to call around and we verified all this information. So now go get the records. We called, they go, yeah, he was here on the Mar in March, just a few months ago and in February. And then he was treating just before that in October and again in January. He was getting imaging done in November and in September of 2019. He went to an urgent care center and there's a typo there, I just noticed, but 10-17, 2020. For a guy that said he's never been injured before, he sure as hell has been treating a heck of a lot, hasn't he? So again, this was all done within the first few weeks of this claim being filed. Do you see this as helpful at any, any point in your claims investigation? Do you see this as saying, you know what? We need to go get those records because this guy did have an orthopedic injury. You know, let's see how much of this we really own, right? I mean, these are red flags. He lied, you know, he's getting medical treatment in LA. He's almost close to retirement age. He's almost close to retirement age. So maybe he's looking to get out on a retirement medical benefit, who knows? But this is fraud. He has lied to you and now we just need to prove it. We need to find that those medical records are gonna make a humongous difference in the mitigation, if not the denial of this claim. So again, this was all done right away. This wasn't done at the end of the claim. Again, Diane, now that we found them, you go get them. You, you sick macro pro on them and you go out and you get those records. Here's another one, Mrs. Pill Popper. We, I actually got a conviction on a case just like this uh, in San Diego, but this was out of Florida, this one. So <clears throat> we found that this claimant was paying cash uh, for muscle relaxers. And uh, we called around to some other pharmacies. The only reason people pay cash sometimes is they don't want it to be found. So, but they had records, excuse me, they had records at CVS, they had records at Walgreens. And if you could get these records, this is the tip. Sometimes all we can find are pharmaceuticals. If you can find the pharmacy records, and Diane, back me up on this. If I can go to a pharmacy, let's say I can't find any medical records, orthopedic stuff but I can find all this pharmacy stuff and they're getting prescriptions. What's going to be on the pharmacy records for your prescriptions? Prescribing doctors. Oh, how about them apples? Right. <laughs> you get the, you get the, you get the prescribing physician. That's, that's maybe giving them muscle relaxing pills. Now we can go back like you've done with chiropractors. You've seen, you've seen records. And I know we have the story about a records where they scratched it out. And this guy was getting chiropractic treatment on the side, but it was in those records. So it's kind of like a Hansel and Gretel. We're laying out the breadcrumbs and you find these records, you go get them. And then a company like MacroPro will go through those records and they'll say, hey, Dr. Smith has been prescribing these muscle relaxers. Let's go call Dr. Smith, right? <clears throat> right, Diane? Yes, absolutely. I hope you're okay. I I'm really- fine. You, uh, you're going through and, and trudging through all of this. No, well, for my, it's the smoke, right? It's all the smoke. Um, yeah, so, so you, you, you get those records and then uh, it'll lead you to the next place. There you go. Now that you found them, what do you do? Yeah, go get them. So like I said, unless the surveillance video is truly sensational, I mean, they're doing backflips, uh, you know, driving a car. I mean, you know, what I, you know what I'm talking about, folks. To really make a big difference, you like Dr. Feelgood? Doc, I made that up. Yeah, because all these QMEs, they're all like a JD and a PhD, and, you know, they all have all these acronyms after their name. Uh, hey, Chris, can yeah. I are you going to tell the story about um, how you had this great surveillance and a doctor would not identify the patient, even though it was very clear? Can you tell that story? Because I think that's that's real good reasons why people have to 
realize they have to really rely on the medical evidence because even excellent surveillance sometimes doctors will deny. So I'm actually I'm actually here with a buddy of mine who's also a PI and I just heard him talking about that very topic. So years ago we had really I've had two cases like that. The first case was in San Francisco and we had really good video of this injured worker and the QME could would just not say I I can identify who that is. Um, I went out and I bought a big screen TV. I blew up that image. I had to. I brought this to South San Francisco with me, with the V. No, I had a CD player. We didn't have VCRs then. I was, I'm in the modern stuff. I had a DVD. I put it in. You know, finally, with it was during depot. We had to go down and depose him. And finally, he admitted he he could recognize him. The second one was up in Santa Rosa, and uh, same thing. He couldn't tell from the video who the injured worker was. Um, and I, I swear to God, even through the depot, he still wouldn't own it, even though the vehicle was registered to him. Um, the house was his address. He he fit the description <coughs> because we were kind of far away on it. Um, so even if you've got really compelling video, if you get an applicant oriented doctor, they're gonna find a loophole not to do it. But I'll tell you what, if I had medical records and I verified that was my guy, they're going to have to take that. Uh, they can't question an X-ray or an MRI or, uh, you know, some other type of treatment, prior surgeries, uh, things like that. So, and, and I'm not saying surveillance video is bad. Just everything has its place. It's like building a house. You're going to want to start with a really strong foundation before you start to put the roof on. Roof can't go first got to have a strong foundation. So build yourself a strong foundation with these investigations by identifying some of this information early. <clears throat> Guys, you know what? I This is the first time I've done this presentation um, without Diane. And usually Diane and I are pretty long-winded. Well, I am. Um, so this is the first time Diane let me do this by myself. And I'm done. Um, I, I know we promised you an hour. I'm sure we'll still give you an hour credit, Diane. Um, so if there aren't any questions, I just want you to do remember a few things. Um, do your, these medical record searches, do your backgrounds right away. It could lead you to questions you never even thought you had to ask. Then go get the records and then please use them. Get those submitted as soon as you can. Um, Diane, I apologize. I, I thought this would take longer and maybe I'm just talking too much. But this gives us an opportunity to talk a little bit about getting records that are not necessarily, you know, in our neighborhoods. Uh, you know, perhaps we need to get records that are out of state. And one of the things everybody needs to know is that we can legally get records from out of state. There was a day in time when I started. Now I have to say that this year or this month, on the 24th will be my 24th anniversary with Macapro. So I'm really excited to have been with them for so long. Wait, and wait, hold I, on, hold on. You just celebrated an anniversary yesterday too. 35 years with my husband. 35 it's, years marriage, 24 years with Macapro. And a birthday at the end of the month. <laughs> it's a great month for me, it's a fantastic month. But to get back to my point, um, when I started 24 years ago, we would serve a California subpoena to outside of the state because we had no dear, we had no options. But we do have options now for us to be able to get those records. There's something called the UIDDA, which basically is a program, a sister state program, where we can serve a, a California subpoena and make it um, legal in another state and get those records for you. It's not easy and it's not necessarily um, inexpensive, but it's not expensive. And the evidence that you're going to get from that is going to be outstanding. So if you need records from out of state, we can help you do that. Um, in fact, if you need records from out of country, we can help you with that as well. MacroPro has secured over, has secured records in over 33 countries on six continents for our clients. Nobody else could say that. I know there are lots of wonderful, wonderful companies out there that do what we do, but we just do it a little better. You know, we have a little bit more infrastructure and we have experts. You know, our managers have been with us on average 
25 years. So I'm still relatively a newbie at, you know, oops, sorry about that. Um, at, you know, 24 years, I'm a newbie compared to some of the other managers. You know, also too, I think people should be aware that there are other tools that we can provide to them to make their record searches a little easier. Your document and retrieval company should be able to assist you. I know we can help our clients. If you want to find out whether or not that person has ever had records copied on them before, you should be able to call them up and they should tell you um, if they've copied on them, when they copied on them, and how many pages. Now, Chris, do you think that we could release those records to our beautiful friends online? Um, <clears throat> what do you mean? Well, if, if I've told them how many pages and where the records are, do you think I could just give them a copy of those records? No. Yeah, you're exactly right. We would definitely have to have a new authorization form and or a subpoena to do that. But yeah. the point is where you can help you with your discovery. Another discovery tool would be um, would be an x-ray breakdown, because if they've um, you you, for example, may be interested in, you know, the upper back. But if we give you a breakdown of everything and you find out, wow, you know, they've had lower back problems or they've had a knee problem, these things might contribute to the claim, right? And maybe you don't own the entire thing. So there are a lot of things that a really great document retrieval company can do to assist you to find those records and make sure that you get the evidence you need to determine that claim. I don't know, after 20, almost 25 years, I'm still very, very passionate about what we do and, and being able to help our clients. Well, you know, like I said, Diane, it's the breadcrumb theory. I mean, when you get these records, it's going to lead you on to down the road to other things. Um, you know, I've, I've heard the story of the chiropractor, uh, like I said, with the pharmacy things. But again, going back to what kind of started all this is this is what the doctors want. OK, they, they need medical evidence. If you can get them the medical evidence they need, they'll they'll reduce that uh, exposure. You know, they'll they'll uh, reduce that PD rating if they think, um, you know, maybe they showed up to the party with a broken knee and uh, this was just an aggravation. I mean, that's that's your job. It's our job to find that stuff for you. I find it. She gets it. You cook it. Right. right? Okay. Isn't that where there's just a circle of a uh, circle of life, circle so of life. Yeah. Yeah. I, I catch it. You clean it. They prepare it. So here's the thing you had mentioned earlier about uh, authorization forms and which ones they should be using and why they should use a all purpose or multi uh, purpose authorization form as opposed to a medical release. So I just wanted to point out the reasons. With the medical release, we're only going to be able to get records from a doctor's office, um, dentist's office, maybe chiropractic's office, those type of places. But if you need bank records, you need employment records, you need to verify other information, you may, you can't get those records with a medical release form. So make it easy on yourself and use an all-purpose authorization form that is HIPAA compliant. If you don't have a copy of it, no worries. We'll provide you with a copy of that. You can email me at D-I-A-N-N at macropro.com and I'll send it to you. You can put it away in your files. Even if you don't utilize our company, I want you to have this tool because it's really going to make it easier for you to get everything you need um, to get those records. I think that's so, so very important. So Chris, I know that there are other things that we've always talked about in the past, and maybe we could take a minute or two to do that. Let me see if there's anybody has it. Wait a minute. I have a, something here. Oh, it says MacroPro is awesome at getting records. Love MacroPro. Well, thank you, Lisa Nichols. We appreciate that very, very much. Um, our clients are our best reference. We always say that. So thank you so much for that. But Chris, a lot of times when we're trying to get records, and one of the things you talk about is asking those questions you know the answers to. So why do you think it's so important to tell them, you know, you know certain information? Like, you were saying something about, have you ever been treated? Would you ever say, have you ever been treated at Dr. Johnson's office? Would you ever say that in in your uh, interviews? Yes, I would. Sorry, everybody's leaving here. Uh, you know, <clears throat> I reference this a lot. Back when I was a, a patrol, working patrol, I was trained in drug recognition. And part of that means that I was able to look at somebody and I could tell they were under the influence. Um, so I was with Clear Lake PD, for those of you that know anything about Clear Lake, 
uh, there's a lot of methamphetamines there. When I would go to a suspect, and I wouldn't ask if, I asked how much. That was my opening salvo. Hey, how much have you used today? Because um, they know that I know that they know. Because um, I just wanted to cut to the quick. I didn't feel like doing the dance with them, as we would say. You know, have you ever used methamphetamine before? Of course they have. They have shot marks up and down. You know, blah blah blah. It really depends on your strategy. Um, if you have an attorney, well, if you have an attorney, you're not going to be asking the questions. But if you already know something. Let's just cut to the quick. It's like pulling a Band-Aid off. Just ask the question. Um, hey, listen, I, I know you've treated for this before. Let's go through this. I'm looking at your index report. I'm looking at the background. I got the medical records search in front of me. Can we just talk about this? Let's not do the dance. Look, you're busy. I know you are. You know, you're carrying, especially these days, everybody's carrying 100, 200 claims. I don't know. <clears throat> Just ask the question. You only get 15 minutes to do your AOCOE anyway, or your initial three-point contact. Just ask. I got it right here. Uh, if you want to take go for the dance, if your if your dance card's not full, have all by all means. Ask vague, ambiguous questions. Or just hey, get to the Chris. yeah. So two years ago, you and I spoke at the CCNC, and this year they they came back and had their conference. I was there, and one of the people in the audience said that um, they actually utilized a few of the things that we had told them. And one of the things we told them was, for example, when we were talking, we said, "Well, I see here that you um, you you have treated for this before because we have this list of all the X-rays that you have had in the past. So this is not a new injury to you." Would you like to close your claim down now rather than calling it fraud or anything else? And he says, you know, I use that and I've actually been able to close down claims because I got information that I know was honest because obviously it's in medical records, right? It's in there. And so he says, I used it. I asked the question. I was able to shut down those claims. So I guess the lessons and the moral to that story is let's not be afraid to ask those questions. They kind of feel uncomfortable, but everything feels uncomfortable at first, right? Um, so I think it's really great if people just ask those really direct questions and then don't be afraid to ask them. You want to shut this claim down right now? Get, yeah, get no, the work on your desk. I agree. <laughs> And look, and if they lie to you, then you got a fraud case, you know, now you can submit that case over to law enforcement for fraud. Um, so it's kind of a win win. But yeah, ask the questions. Don't be yeah. afraid. Well, Chris, I want to thank you. I know that um, you were double booked today and you were a real trooper for hanging yeah. out and doing this for everybody. Everybody, we want to be sure to thank Chris for his service. Not only was he in law enforcement, but he also served our country honorably, both was it in the Army and Marines? Yeah, you couldn't tell. I, I, I had to do something the other day, so I shaved my face. It took 10 years off of me. So, <laughs> hey, All here's, right. my, here's, my, here's my buddy, Rod. He's a PI. If you ever need him, he's say hi to 62 people. Hey, 62 people. <laughs> yeah. All right, get out of here. All right. Well, thanks, yeah, Diane. Hey, you that, know, but nice. and thank you for doing this. You know, this means a lot to all of us. Uh, I know a lot of people are sitting at home in their jammies still doing their laundry. Uh, I wish I could be, but the technology that's out here today, I mean, look at this, 62 people from all over the state, you're in Washington, I'm up in the pines, breathing this fresh air, and here we are. Yes, well, Tammy says thank you for the great tips, and um, Michelle uh, Goldsmith says hello, Chris, so everybody is sending you... <laughs> All right, there's like my number. Call me. All right. <laughs> Thanks, Diane. Right. Take care, everybody. God bless. Thank you. All right. Remember, you'll be getting your, your certificates in the mail today. If you have any questions, be sure to uh, reach out to Chris and I. We'll be happy to help you guys. Until next time, thank you for joining us at Macro Pro and Friends. Bye bye now. All right, Chris, I'm going to end the webinar. Okay, I'll call you.